Okay, we're back. We're live for the three o'clock block on a given Wednesday. I'm Jay Fidel. This is ThinkTech, and more specifically, this is Energy in America. Uh, and in, in lieu of Lou Pugliarisi, uh, we have Emily Medina in Mexico City. She's going to tell us about things in Mexico. There are a lot of things happening in Mexico. Hi, Emily. Hi, Jay. I'm excited to be here today. So nice to see you. Um, so let's talk about let's talk about the, the you know the headline news in Mexico today, and uh, that is the earthquake in the south of Mexico. What happened? Well, uh, um, we experienced an earthquake in the southeast Mexico um, in Oaxaca. Um, the earthquake was been pretty um, intense. We it was a seven point five magnitude. Um, Luckily, um, there wasn't uh, many fatalities. There was about six fatalities in total. Um, and this was because um, the epicenter, like I said, was in Oaxaca, which is not as densely populated as other areas of the country, such as Mexico City, which is very vulnerable to earthquakes um, and has a very dense population. And, and typically sees um, a larger disaster when, when when earthquakes hit that part of the country. So it's fortunate that um, it wasn't as bad. I saw some uh, I saw some video about uh, the damage, and there were a number of buildings that were wrecked, fell into the street, sort of thing. And I wonder if Mexico has the ability to respond and rebuild, because uh, you know you're you're under duress now. You have COVID. Um, you have a, a lockdown and an attempt to reopen, just like we do. And I wonder if the economy stands in the way of rebuilding the areas that were damaged. Well, um, unfortunately, Oaxaca is one of the poorest states in the country. Um, there's a high percentage of indigenous population in the country. And, um, and this type of natural disaster is definitely and can have a, a toll on that um, state's economy. Um, particularly, um, there's very weak infrastructure in, in that part of the country, um, precisely because of the um, low economic growth that they've experienced over the past years. So this will definitely um, affect uh, Oaxaca's recovery going forward. Um, in the past, when you've had uh, natural disasters like this, has the United States stepped up and provided assistance uh, either in kind or in money? And fortunately, the U.S. and Mexico tend to have a very strong um, coordination approach um, when a disaster hits either in the U.S. or in Mexico. So, like, for example, like we saw in, when Hurricane Katrina hit, and Mexico was there to, to help provide aid to the U.S. and send the military who was also there to help and recover. So right now, Mexico, we expect, you know, the same type of um, um, support coming from the U.S. Um, and it's likely that we're going to see um, that type of uh, of response of a coordinated effort between the U.S. and Mexico. However, um, given that you know it wasn't as huge as an of an impact, and, um, and there's no um, lives at risk, and so much as we've seen in other type of natural disasters, um, I, I expect Mexico to be able to to have. A response and, and to have the necessary um, equipment and to respond to this event. And yeah, but I wouldn't. Um, I wouldn't expect you. You know, you're going to see a big, a big assist from the United States. I mean, after all, we have a lot of money problems here. We've just spent trillions, um, trillions, I say, um, you know, trying to deal with um, you know the reopening and, and COVID, mostly the reopening. Um, and uh, just this morning, uh, Trump announced that he was going to spend $500 million painting the wall uh, black. He's still, he's still building the wall. I find that wow. remarkable. He's still building the wall with all of these dire circumstances around. He's still being, and in fact, he's spending more money than before building the wall. How do people in Mexico feel about that? Well, <laughs> um, 
Well, I mean, there's been constant Mexican people um, coming from the White House, and that's definitely um, it's it's pretty um, unfortunate, um, given that we have. Uh, so uh, a strong integration in our economy and in, in other aspects. So definitely um, that um, type of rhetoric coming from the White House um, is it has a purpose, you know. And the purpose is that it helps get it helps get votes. Um, so I believe that you know as elections um, approach, that rhetoric is going to start um, building up. And uh, what's particularly um, upsetting, I feel, for the Mexican people is the, their own president's response. Um, so, and as you may already know, uh, Mex um, AMLO, uh, Mexico's president, is planning a visit um, to the White House on July 1st. So basically, I mean, this sends um, a message to the Mexican people, which is basically that, you know, um, whatever, you know, Trump is saying about building a wall or, you know, Mexican immigrants or, you know, and those types of negative comments towards the Mexican people is basically sending the message that the Mexican president doesn't care and about these types of, of um, messages and is going to anyways and um, go to the White House and be cordial and you know basically do whatever Trump wants him to do. Mm. Too bad. I mean he's been known, uh, Lopez has been known not to be weak in the uh, foreign policy and foreign relations uh, department and this isn't going to improve his reputation nor nor is it likely he's going to achieve anything but we'll see we'll see. I, I think a lot of foreign leaders have trouble um, get it, making deals with Trump and, uh, and having those deals stick at the end of the day. Um, it, it always dissolves somehow. Uh, but let's let's go to um, let's go what's happening um, about about the economy. Well, let's go to, to COVID first. You have you know it's like Mexico is a mirror in, image of the United States in so many ways. Um, you're our, you're our you're our cousin, our neighbor. You know, as we go, you go, and as you go, we go. Uh, so uh, I'm just wondering, you know, what, what is the level of threat, if you will, uh, of COVID in Mexico? Well, um, so Mexico, you know, um, didn't have it as, uh, as quickly as uh, the U.S. did. So the U.S. started, you know, having um, a large number of cases early in the year. I mean, about in March, I think it were. April was when you know you started to have um, an, an increased number of cases and you know where COVID was at its peak and so Mexico was still you know um, doing well and however you know we just yesterday we saw the largest number of cases um, recorded in Mexico so that tells you that we still have a very long way to go in terms mm -hmm. of the pandemic um, and you know and it hasn't been as bad here in Mexico as it has in the states I think and largely in part because we were able to to prepare for it a little bit more than than what the U.S. Um, had a chance to prepare um, and you know and in, and even in Europe you know they had it before so this gave us a little bit of a uh, a leapfrogging effect in terms of you know how we're going to manage this crisis and i think i mean from a bottom-up approach it's been pretty effective um different states are you know taking different measures in mexico uh, um for example even in some in states they even went as far as banning alcohol in order to prevent social gatherings and what have you so definitely, I mean, this has helped this, um, in terms of limit the spread of COVID, um, but right now we're still struggling. And I think we haven't seen the worst of it yet. Mm. Um, yeah, we had another show earlier today where somebody was going into that. Uh, alcohol has a, um, a socializing effect. Alcohol makes people want to get together and talk to each other. Alcohol is a social experience around the world. 
And so if you, if you have a lot of alcohol, if you open the bars, for example, everybody's going to be having a conversation without a mask. Before you know it, you know, you have an upswing. Uh, and, and I suppose the, uh, the government is smart uh, to say, wait a minute, hold up on the alcohol, because there's a direct relationship. Yeah, and, and results are already showing that, you know, um, so they ban alcohol then and, and the, the cases were, were going, coming down, then, you know, the government decided to start reopening the economy and cases um, rose again. So right now they're going back to banning alcohol. So. Yeah. What else are they doing? Are they requiring masks on the street? Are they requiring, are they closing down gatherings and... Uh... Uh, assem assemblages uh, are they are they putting limits on churches for example uh, on events on entertainment what what are they doing yes so they're requiring masks everybody needs to be wearing their masks out in the street and um, in terms of social gathering i mean they, the government can't prohibit this but they're really um enforcing i mean they're really um, communicating to the people that they need to stay home and they need to maintain their distance with people. Um, in terms of, you know, um, in, in, the, in the workforce, um, we are seeing that um, businesses are still um, having lockdown measures. Um, so th that will take a little bit um, longer in terms of allowing workers to start coming to work. However, the private sector, I think, has been much better at enforcing these measures than the own government. So I think that's been one of the issues. I mean, so when I said, you know, the banning of alcohol, that's coming from a local level. Mm -hmm. In terms of the state governments, they're taking, I think, the right approach but it's been pretty different from the federal level approach, which it has been more, um, more laid back in terms of enforcing different measures. You know, we still have, um, so for example, Pemex um, continued its operations as normal. We had, you know, people coming to work from Pemex and, um, and that caused um, several, um, several deaths, um, even within Pemex, as a result of not um, taking the measures seriously. Mm -hmm. So are people, are people happy with uh, the way the government, both federal and state in Mexico, have responded to, to COVID? Uh, or do they feel that the government has done too much or too little? Well, um, from the state level, they feel like the government acted too soon. So this um, had a, an impact on the economy at mm. a local level. Mm. The fact that, you know, even when, you know, cases were pretty low, um, the government decided to close schools and, and take all the necessary containment measures. And some people argue that it was too soon to do so. And uh, so that's from the local level. And on the, on the federal level, um, I think people are pretty unhappy when, with the way that the government has dealt with this situation, given that, you know, I, and the government is not setting the example, you know, and he, the government's been um, having different uh, tours around the, the country, um, or how do you call them, like um, different campaign trails or what have you, um, where they go to different parts of the country to inaugurate different projects. For example, the Tren Maya, which is one of his pilot projects um, in the south of Mexico. Um, so the, the government um, went to the inauguration, traveled by airplane, and he flies commercial. So this is also a concern in terms of setting the example. Because you know, the, and, and the the health official is asking people to stay home and and to take the necessary measures, and at the same time, we have the government, you know, just flying around the, the country. Or actually, um, he he took a uh, uh, he went by by car now that I recall, but still, I mean, uh, he's on the road and as same and as business as usual. So this is definitely an anger. A little bit of people. Yeah, that's a risk. It's a risk for sure. Tell me about. Uh, tell me about your life, Emily. I mean, how life? How has your life changed? Have you locked yourself up? Uh, you're working at home. Uh, what's it like? 
Yeah, I've been working at home. Um, I've been taking it pretty seriously from home. Um, I don't even, you know, go to the store. Um, I get all my groceries online, which is pretty nice. Um, and, and, and it's pretty um, easy to get everything you need from your home, you know. There's all these different um, apps <laughs> of, you know, uh, of food deliveries. And, and, and so you can get everything without, you know, having to step out of your house, which is, and without having That's to expose yourself to the risk. So it's been pretty um pretty convenient to be able to get those services from home. Yeah, it sounds like um, a lot of people in Hawaii are living pretty much that way still now, even though we're trying to reopen. Um, what about the border? How has the border been affected? I know that uh, Trump closed the border, is it? I mean, what's the situation at the border right now? Can people travel across the border one way or the other? Or is it some kind of lockdown on the border? Well, I believe there's been some exchanges between, you know, the different administrations in the U.S. and Mexico on what approach they want to take in terms of, you know, restricting travel or allowing it. And I know uh, the U.S. said that they did not um, want any unessential, unessential travel um, to the U.S. from Mexico. I believe Mexico does not have that policy and, you know, it's still a free and border and you know everybody can come <laughs> so um that's definitely i mean uh, you know it's a different approach that they're taking and um, in terms of you know um the covid spread i don't know which country is riskier right now i know both of them are pretty um, bad with this COVID situation yeah, yeah. What about, uh, you know, we, we had for a month, uh, and to some extent we still do have a month, I mean, a month of uh, demonstrations, Black Lives Matter and all that. And of course, uh, the word was that, uh, that it, was, it was in Europe, it, that they were also having demonstrations there, it was in Asia. And I wonder if you had that experience in Mexico. Did you have demonstrations that were uh, sympathetic with the American demonstrations? There was a riot but, um, from uh, Guadalajara. Um, so this, uh, you know, the Black uh, Lives Matter movement kind of um, uh, was viewed here. It, it kind of um, caused people to react in terms of what our own policemen are doing to, to the local people. And uh, there's Basically, was one case um, which a person with the name of Giovanni, which you know, um, started becoming very uh, known and very heard of. And this case was sounding in all of Mexico. Um, so basically, and people from Guadalajara who got very angry from this situation of you know of this victim who suffered police brutality, um, they went over to Mexico City. And you know, started you know. Um, actually, I think they they did some riots on the um, the U.S. embassy. So, but it was pretty small. I mean, it wasn't um, a movement like mm -hmm. it is in the U.S. It was uh, you know an independent case. Yeah, okay, no, no, no violence, no, um, um, no violence, no, uh, yeah, no violent demonstrations. Yeah, I mean, it got pretty violent from what I saw in the news, you know, people were throwing mm. things at the buildings and stuff. Interesting. Well, let's go, uh, to the, let's go to the economy. Of course, we want to find out, you mentioned, uh, what, what is it, Pemex um, and the pr production of oil in Mexico, which is important. And so there have been discussions around the world with uh, OPEC and the OPEC OPEC plus, I think you call it OPEC organizations uh, that, that, that make for um, uh, co uh, collaborative agreements on how much oil a given country should produce. So uh, what has happened with uh, Mexico vis-a-vis uh, -vis the United States? Yeah, so, you know, Mexico used to be uh, one of the largest producers in the world. I mean, it still has a lot of oil and it's still um, Pretty large in terms of its, you know, petroleum um, activity. 
However, you know, uh, Mexico um, switched the role from a producer to a consumer. And right now, what was discussed in this um, OPEC Plus meeting during, I believe it was around April, was that they were, you know, discussing how they were gonna uh, globally cut production to increase oil prices. And what happened was that um, Mexico was required to cut about 350,000 barrels per day uh, to comply with its own share. Because every country has a different share according to how much they're producing and what have you. So Mexico um, was not satisfied with this quota and they wanted to, um, to cut production only by 100,000 barrels instead, instead of the 350,000. Or I believe it was 400 and 400,000 uh, barrels per day. So what happened was that um, you know after some heated negotiations, and I believe it was um, the Secretary of Energy who was at the meeting and you know discussing with the different OPEC uh, members, and you know they were negotiating how much they would cut, and this you know delayed the meeting and it was pretty scandalous. Um, and then at the end, you know, the U.S. said that they would pick up the, the share um, uh, that was remaining in order to comply with requirements. So Mexico. Can, can you repeat that, Emily? We didn't. We didn't hear that today. very well. Can you? Can, can you? Yeah, can you, can you so, repeat the upshot of that meeting? So yeah. So basically, I mean, the meetings. Um, lasted longer than expected because Mexico was um, still negotiating in terms of how much it wanted to cut. It wasn't satisfied with the quotas that were established you know, by the other OPEC members. So what happened was that Mexico said, we're only gonna cut 100,000 barrels, 100,000 barrels per day, and the other 350,000 barrels per day, um, you know, we're not gonna be cut. So what happened was that basically Mexico and the U.S. Um, coordinated, um, you know, a response, and the U.S. decided to pick up the share that Mexico wasn't willing to cut, which was the three hundred and fifty thousand barrels per day. So basically, um, you know, Mexico sent a very bad signal to the world in terms of. Um, its willingness to coordinate with the international community. Mm. On the other hand, the 350,000 barrels a day for the U.S. is chicken feed, isn't it? Yeah, so that's why they were so willing to pick up on the slack, I mean, or the, or the you know, the remaining. Yeah. Tell me about the economy in general. I mean, it's certainly, uh, Oil production is a big part of the economy in Mexico, or it has been. Um, and um, how is the economy, you know, working? I suppose you run a parallel with the United States. Uh, you have COVID, you lock everything down, and then you take signals from various leaders, including Trump. Uh, okay, we're back. We've we've licked it. We don't have COVID anymore. That sort of message. Uh, and then you try to restart the economy. Is that where you are? And how is it going? Exactly. That's exactly where we are, um, where the government is basically saying, you know, reopen. The federal government, you know, is starting to say it's okay, you know, it's not a big deal. Um, and at the same time, we, our economic projections um, from the IMF, um, you know, um, just um, yesterday they were announced at um, a contraction for this year of 10%. So the the contraction, this is the, you know, one of the, the worst estimates that we've seen so far. The, you know, ever since the COVID-19 started, you know, those projections have been just increasing in terms of the economic contraction that Mexico is about to face or is facing right now during this year. Um, so it's pretty unfortunate in terms of, you know, because even if the government is saying that everything's okay, it's definitely not <laughs> in terms of, um, of the message it's sending and the, the response that it's 
giving. Um, you know, there has been very little support for the private sector. Um, there's in Mexico, uh, unlike the U.S., there hasn't been an economic stimulus to respond to this crisis, and that um, is really starting to hurt small businesses. And you know we our unemployment rates are um, are very high, and as in, in the same case goes to the U.S. Um, however, there's no economic stimulus right now in place, which is detrimental. Yeah, well, we, you know we 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 forget that Mexico gets our television, uh, and if there's three three trillion dollars spent in the U.S. on economic stimulus, everybody in Mexico knows that. Um, and then they look at their own government and say, what happened to ours? Why can't our government? People must have a, a certain disappointment. Am I right? Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, people, I mean, it, unlike, I mean, well, there's still still poverty in different parts of the U.S., but here in Mexico, it's particularly changing where, you know, there's people who are unable to get food because of the economic conditions. So it's going to be important that the government, you know, um, recognizes um, the role it's playing in terms of, you know, of attracting foreign investment to mm -hmm. the country. So in, in the 30s, uh, you know, the U.S. Uh, had a serious depression, which took 10 years to get out of. And if I had to guess, I would guess that Mexico likewise had a serious depression in the 30s, where people yes. were at work, unemployment. Are you, are you worried about that now, Emily? Is that a possibility now for Mexico? Yeah, I am very worried about the situation in Mexico. Um, you know, the numbers don't look good in terms of our economic outlook. And right now, and, and the problem was in the economic problem started even before COVID-19. You know, we had, in 2019, we also had an economic contraction, a technical recession, and this was before COVID-19. So, so what we're seeing is that the policies that this government is proposing is not, are not working in terms of providing economic growth for the country. On the contrary, they're, you know, scaring off in foreign investment or even Mexican companies that, you know, that we're thinking about investing in Mexico are right now holding those investments because of the situation. And the situation is, is rooted in the fact that, you know, the government um, wants to rescue Pemex, the state, uh, the state owned oil company. Yeah. And, and it wants to, you know, um, to undermine private uh, and participation. Yeah. Well, we'll have to check back with you. I uh, hope we can do that soon uh, to see how Mexico is doing. Uh, it's great to have, it's great to have this discussion with you, Emily, to find out through your eyes uh, how Mexico is doing. We want to know and we, I, let me add that there are some people in this country really, really care about Mexico. So <laughs> we need to keep talking. Great day. Glad to hear that. <laughs> Thank you, Emily. Emily Medina from EPRINC Energy you. Policy Research Foundation. And we look forward to our next discussion with you. Aloha, stay safe.